Hi, welcome to Bookshelf Games. I'm Lawrence. And I'm Ira. Uh, this week we're continuing our series on Magic Realm. Magic Realm, again, was made in 1978, published by Avalon Hill, and designed by Richard Hamlin. Uh, this week we're going over part four, the daylight. Uh, daylight's going to be one of the main parts of the game, where all those actions that we recorded during Birdsong are going to be performed uh, during this daylight section, um, in order that they're recorded in Birdsong. So, we'll go ahead and take a look at how the actions work now. Section 4, Daylight. During daylight, players choose attention shits randomly, one at a time. When a character's attention shit is picked, he and all of his followers become unhidden. That character then does the phases of his turn. When a character starts his turn, he becomes unhidden if he was hidden. He then does the phases of his turn. On each phase, he does the following in order. First, he may rearrange his belongings. If he's in the clearing with another character, then he may trade belongings with the character in his clearing perform the next activity recorded for this phase, playing action shifts as required by the activity. After performing the activity, he can either block a character he's in the same clearing with, or if he's in a clearing with a monster, he, will be, he may be blocked. When a character's turn ends, either by finishing his last activity, stops following another character or is blocked. The following things happen in order. All prowling monsters in his tile move to his clearing. He turns all map chits in his tile face up and exchange or substitutes the chits as appropriate. <coughs> The game pieces in the tile can summon new denizens from the appearance chart if they line up with the active monster role. He can block any monsters that appear in or move to his clearing, and the monsters will block all unhidden characters in the clearing. Rearranging belongings and trading. Before each activity, the moving character can rearrange his belongings. He can also trade with any other characters that are in the clearing. Non-moving characters cannot make deals with each other. They can only trade with the moving character. Hidden characters can trade with other characters without becoming unhidden. Followers can rearrange or trade any time their guide can. They can trade with each other or with other characters in a clearing. Characters can either trade belongings or sell them to each other for whatever gold price they agree on. Doing activities. Characters do the activities that are recorded for them left to right. Remember that a player cannot choose to cancel an activity voluntarily unless the rules say differently. If for some reason he finds the activity is illegal when he begins to do it, then it is canceled. Number one, hiding, the hide activity. To do the hide activity, a player must have recorded an H on their sheet during birdsong. When he does the activity, he rolls two die on the hide table. If the roll is less than a six, remember we look at the highest value die, in this case they're both fours, then the character becomes hidden. He will then flip his character token green side up to indicate that he is hidden. On the roll of a six, 
His counter stays the same, so characters who are already hidden can skip any subsequent hide rolls they have. Hidden characters are safer from denizens, and other characters have to do the search activity to find them. A hidden character can continue to do all normal activities and remains hidden while doing them, unless the rules say otherwise. A hidden character can choose to stop hiding at the end of each phase of his turn. Otherwise, he stays hidden until the rules say differently. So unless something changes his status, a character who is hidden at the end of his turn will remain hidden until the beginning of his next turn. 2. Movement, the move activity. In order to move his counter from clearing to clearing, a player must have recorded a move activity during Birdsong. The activity is written M with a dash followed by the clearing to which the character will move. The clearing is identified by the name of the clearing, and you can use initials like AV for Awful Valley, and clearing number. For example, for this movement, the player will record M-AV4. The following rules govern movement. A character must follow roadways when he moves. He can use open roads, tunnels, or bridges freely. But he may only use hidden tunnels or hidden paths if he has discovered it, as we'll see during the search activity. If a character comes to a place where his roadway runs over or under another road, he must stay on the roadway he is using. Each roadway connects only two clearings. Each move must be to a clearing adjacent to the one in which the character started his phase. Certain areas of the realm are harder to move through than others. In order to enter a mountain clearing, a character must record two move activities to the clearing on consecutive phases of the same day. When the activities are performed, the first recorded move is treated as a blank phase. The next recorded move will take the character all the way from his starting clearing to his destination. Note that this is only required to enter a mountain clearing. There is no penalty for leaving a mountain clearing. Though the penalty is assessed for moving from one mountain clearing to another. It only takes one move to enter a cave, but a character may not enter a cave clearing on the same day he uses a sunlight phase. Remember from Birdsong, you get two normal phases and two sunlight phases after your normal phases. If you spend any time in the cave, you're not going to get to use those sunlight phases. Players must also inactivate their horses when they enter a cave clearing. The horse is still considered active at the beginning of the phase. It is not inactivated until the move is completed. So it is possible to use a bonus move caused by a horse to enter a cave from a non-cave clearing, but not vice versa. Carrying items. A character can own any number of items regardless of their weight as long as he stays in the same clearing. However, if he moves, he must play a move chip to carry his items with him. The strength letter he plays defines the heaviest weight he can carry. He can carry any number of items that weight or lower. He must abandon all heavier items before he leaves. If he decides to play nothing, only his horse and items of a negligible weight move with him. A player cannot cancel a legal recorded move just because he is forced to abandon belongings. If a character needs an item to do a bonus phase later in the turn, he must play enough move strength 
to carry the card. Playing the move chip does not exhaust it in any way. It will stay active. The player simply indicates the chip he is using, leaving it with the other active chips. A character with an active horse can use the horse in place of a moved chip. In this case, the strength of the horse defines what he can carry. A strong horse can be very useful for a character who doesn't have strong moved chips. Leaving the map. A character can move along a roadway to the map edge the same way he would move to a clearing. He simply records edge as the clearing he is moving to. When he does the activity, he leaves the game. And that will be covered later in the videos. Number three, the search activity. A player records an S on their paper during birdsong in order to do a search activity. When a character does the activity, the player chooses where the character is searching. Peer and locate. The peer and locate tables are the basic search tables of Magic Realm. They are mostly used to discover hidden things. Hidden paths, secret passages, and treasure site chits are considered to be concealed inside the clearing they are located. To use them, characters must first discover them with a good role on the appropriate table. Normally, a character can only search in his own clearing. However, if the character is in a mountain clearing, he can choose to peer into any woods or mountain clearing in his own tile or in any adjacent tile. The player must specify the clearing and then roll on the peer table. He will then apply the results as if he were in the clearing he chose. Loot. If a character is in a clearing with a sight chip he has already discovered, another option became, comes open to him, rolling on the loot table. Each sight chip has a box on the setup card where the treasures hidden at that site are stored. Characters obtain these treasures by looting the site. They may also use the loot table to take items from a pile of abandoned belongings in their clearing. This works just like with the site chip, except the pile does not have to be discovered first. Piles of abandoned belongings and site chips may be in the same clearing. If a character is to search a clearing with both a site chip and a pile of abandoned belongings, he must first specify if he is looting the site or the pile of belongings. When rolling on the loot table, a player will roll two dice unless they have special abilities otherwise. And as a normal roll, you're going to take the higher number of the two. Some treasure locations, in particular the treasures within treasures, will actually have a separate table telling you what to take on certain rolls. Most treasure locations do not, however. What you're going to do is roll, and then for whatever you roll, you're going to count down. So if you had rolled a one, you will take the top treasure, whether it be a weapon, an armor, a horse, or a card. Um, if you roll a two, you take the next one down, and you continue on that way down to the sixth item. If you roll something like a six, and there's only four treasures available at that site, then you do not take anything. Looting a stack of abandoned belongings works the exact same way. A player will roll two dice unless he has an ability or item that allows him to do differently. He'll take the higher number and then in the stack he will count down. In this case with the six there's only four items so the character will not get anything. When the character does successfully loot an item or treasure card he must immediately decide if he wants to leave it abandoned in the clearing or activate it or take it as inactive. If a player loots a face down sight chip, he must turn it face up for all to see. 
looking through the other sight shits if necessary. When he has completed looting that sight shit, he turns it face down again. Special sights. There are three sights that have special requirements when looted. The Karns. To tear apart the Karns, a player must fatigue one asterisk of any type before rolling on the loot table. The Pool. A player must fatigue one asterisk of any type each time he successfully loots an item from the pool. If the character has no asterisks that he may fatigue, then he may not loot the pool. The Vault. The first time the Vault is looted, the character must play a chit, horse, or treasure card with tremendous strength to open it. If he plays a chit, that chit gets fatigued. Once one player opens the vault, it may be looted by any character. 4. Trading with natives. A character records a T to trade with the natives. When the character does the activity during daylight, he specifies one native leader in his clearing and states whether he will be buying or selling. A player can also decide to cancel a trade activity instead of using it. This is an exception to the general rule that recorded activities must be performed if possible. Each native leader owns the belongings in his box on the setup card. He always has these belongings with him ready to trade. He also has an unlimited amount of gold to spend. This gold is not recorded anywhere, it just appears when he buys something from a character. Selling. Native leaders always buy everything that is offered to them. To sell, a player reveals any number of belongings and adds the basic gold price of each to his gold already recorded. The gold price of a treasure card is in the lower right corner in bold. The gold price of any items is in a chart in the back of the rules. Everything that a character sells is put in the box in order of counter size. So treasures will go on the bottom and sold counters will go under counters of the like size. If a character sells more than one belonging of the same size, he arranges them as he chooses, then places them under any similar belongings of that size that are already there. Armor can sometimes be damaged during battle. The price list in the back of the rules has a special price for armor that's being sold when it's damaged. When damage is sold to a native group, it is immediately placed undamaged side up as the natives have prepared that armor. Buying. Once again, when a person uses a trade activity during daylight, they must specify which native leader they are going to do that trade activity with. Buying. Unlike selling, a character can only buy one belonging per trade activity. Once a character has said which hired leader he's going to try and buy from, he may look at all of the armor and weapon counters and treasure cards that that higher leader is selling. And then he specifies which item he would like to try and buy. If he chooses a treasure card, he simply indicates which position that treasure card is in in the stack. He does not reveal it unless he succeeds in purchasing it. Once a character looks at the seller's cards, the character is committed to trying to buy something. To find the price for that item, the player must first find his trade relationship with that group. The player will then roll two dice, compare the higher number 
to the appropriate column on the meeting table. The outcome may be that the character gets the item for free, that he has to pay a modified price, or it could even lead to battle. If he likes, he can buy drinks for the leader's group before he rolls. This will allow the character to make a roll on the next higher level of friendliness. The new level only lasts for one roll. Only one round of drinks is effective per phase. Buying drinks costs one gold for each native of the group. So in this case for the soldiers, it would cost four gold. If the meeting table gives a price, the character can buy the belonging for that indicated price. Or he can decline and pay nothing. He can pay all or part of the price by trading in other belongings valuing each of these belongings at its basic gold price. A player must reveal any treasure cards he obtains, even if he gets it for free. Fame price. Some treasure cards specify a native group and number of fame points in parentheses. When a character sells this item, he gains the fame points indicated. If he were to buy the card from the leader, he loses the fame points indicated, in addition to any gold which changes hands. 5. Fatigue and Resting, the rest activity. As described during the guide to playing pieces, a character's chits can either be active and available for use, or inactive and out of play. Inactive chits are in one of two states fatigued or wounded. All are kept in the same place, but fatigued chits are kept face up while wounded chits are face down. Typically, chits will become inactive as a result of combat, although other game mechanics may inactivate chits as well. All action chits either have zero, one, or two effort asterisks on them. These asterisks indicate how tiring the maneuver is for the character to perform. When a player is directed to fatigue one asterisk, he must move an active action shit that has one effort asterisk to the inactive area face up. Alternatively, he may fatigue a two asterisk shit and make change by activating a chit of the same type with only one effort asterisk on it. This chit that he made change for must be of the same type that he had fatigued. If he cannot do either of these, he must fatigue a two asterisk chit and lose the extra asterisk. If a player is directed to fatigue more than one asterisk, he can make up the total by combining any one or two asterisk chits he wishes. Wounds work slightly differently. A player is never directed to wound asterisks. He may only wound whole chits. To wound a chit, the player takes any of his active chits and puts it with his inactive chits face down regardless of whether it has one, two, or zero effort asterisks on that chit. If a player has no active chits left, he must wound one of his fatigued chits. If a player has no fatigued chits left to wound, then he is killed. When all of the character's chits are either wounded or fatigued, the character is only able to perform rest actions. Any other recorded activities are canceled and he must rest at the next opportunity. If he cannot do the rest activity for some reason, he is killed. The character records an R during birdsong to do the rest activity. 
The rest activity will allow him to return inactive chits to play. When a character does the rest activity, he may do one of the following. He may activate a wounded action chit with no effort asterisks on it. He may activate a fatigued one asterisk chit. Or he may flip over a wounded one asterisk chit, making it a fatigued chit. Or the character may activate a fatigued two asterisk chit, or make a wounded two asterisk chit fatigued. In either case, to do it, he must make change by putting back a chit with one asterisk on it. This chit does not have to be of the same type. Number six, alerting weapons, the alert activity. A weapon counter is alerted when the side of the counter that shows the asterisk is face up. This side is red for regular weapons and gold for treasure counters. Weapons can attack with either side up but are most effective with the alerted side up. Only active weapons, not inactive weapons, may be alerted. A player records an A to use the alert activity to alert or unalert his weapon during his turn. When he does the activity, he may turn his weapon either side up that he wishes. Weapons can also be alerted or unalerted in combat, as we'll see during the next video. The results of following, the follow activity. As we said during Birdsong, if a player chooses to use the following activity, he writes an F and the character's name in parentheses on his sheet. He must have been in the same clearing with that character in order to follow. His character token is then taken and placed with the active belongings of the character he will be following. During daylight, characters who are following do not take activities of their own, but do what their guide does. When the guide does an activity, each follower shares, as is explained below. Hide. The guide's result applies to himself and any of his followers. So if the guide's hide succeeds, it succeeds for his followers. Move. Each follower who can do the activity moves along with the guide. Followers who cannot do the move would be immediately left behind. Doing other bonus moves do not cause followers to be left behind. Followers may move with their guides through hidden paths or passages, discovering the roadways in the process. Search. If the guide looks at a map chip, finds hidden enemies, or makes discoveries, his followers do also, even if he is hidden. If he loots a site or stack of belongings, only he gets the reward. Rests or alerts. If the guide uses a phase to rest a chit or alert his weapon, any of his followers have the option to also rest a chit or alert their weapon. This is decided secretly and happens simultaneously. When the guide does any other activity, the follower will do nothing. Notice, however, that a guide can share his bonus phases with his followers. The members of a group are assumed to be aiding one another. A character has the option to stop following at any time his guide starts an activity. If he does, his counter is put back on the map in the guide's clearing and his turn ends. After the guide does his activity, the X follower goes through the steps of ending his turn as if it were the end of his last phase. He can block or be blocked and can summon denizens and cause them to move. When this is finished, his guide continues his turn from where he left off with his own blocking segment. 
all followers automatically stop following right after their guide does the last activity of his turn. If multiple characters stop following at the same time, they end their turns one after the other. The order does not matter. Blocking. Monsters and other characters can interfere with the character's plans while he takes his turn. Characters can also interfere with prowling monsters. These interruptions are called blocking. At the end of each phase of a character's turn, blocking can take place in his clearing as follows. If a character is unhidden when he ends a phase of his turn, all monsters in his clearings automatically block him. If he is in a clearing with another character, that character may choose to block him. If a character is hidden at the end of his phase, only characters who have found him are able to block him. Monsters are unable to find hidden characters. The moving character may choose to do some blocking of his own. He may block any unhidden character in his clearing. And if he has found hidden enemies that day, he may block a hidden character in that clearing. He may also block any monsters in a clearing with him. It's important to note though, characters that are following cannot block or be blocked. Only the guide character may be blocked. Once a character has stopped following, however, he may then block or be blocked. Blocking is mutual. A character or monster who blocks is blocked in return. Being blocked has the following effects on a character. If hidden, any character who is blocked becomes unhidden. If he is currently taking his turn, all remaining phases for the day are canceled. If he has not yet taken a turn, he does not get a turn that day. His attention ship will be ignored when it is drawn. He may not trade, including buying, selling, or sharing information with other characters while they are taking their turns during the day. He must wait until the evening to trade. Monsters who are blocked stop prowling and cannot move for the rest of the day. Blocking has no other effect on them. At the end of a turn, when monsters arrive or move on the map, blocking can occur as well. For clarification, being blocked does not prevent characters and monsters from blocking other characters. So if the wizard were to come through this clearing, he could then be blocked by both the um, Tremendous Troll or the Berserker. Prowling only affects the way a monster moves around the map. Monsters who are not prowling still block and fight normally. Natives do not block characters in clearings the way monsters do. They can only block if the character rolls on the meeting table for some reason. Natives cannot be blocked since they don't move once they're on the map. Blocking has no effect on them. The end of the turn. When each character ends his turn, prowling denizens may arrive from off of the setup card and prowling monsters may move around the tile. Once a denizen appears in a tile, it stays in that tile until it is either killed or regenerated to the setup card. Monsters. First, if there are any prowling monsters in the character's tile, they move to his clearing. Remember, monsters that were blocked by another character will not move, since they are considered to be no longer prowling. Second, if the character is in a tile with any face-down map chits, those chits are turned face up. Map chits 
with numbers on them are placed in the corresponding clearing. Certain chips, called replacement chips, bring other pieces to the board when they are revealed. The yellow Stink W chit is immediately replaced by the large campfire. The yellow Smoke W chit is immediately replaced with the small campfire. The campfires are placed on the highest numbered clearing in a tile that connects back to the borderlands. If either the Lost City or Lost Castle map chits are revealed, then you will take the stack of five chits that was put aside during the setup for the appropriate chit, either the Lost Castle or the Lost City. These will be taken and placed in the tile as appropriate. The Lost Castle or Lost City chit itself remains in the tile. Each chit that was just turned up may summon monsters. If the chit is listed above a box in the row of monsters that is currently prowling, and if the box has one or more monster counters in it, those monsters will come to the board. If the chit is listed above a group of boxes, it summons the monsters from the leftmost occupied box only. That when a sound shit is listed followed by a parentheses M or parentheses C, it only summons a monster to the corresponding M or C warning shit in the tile. Monsters that are summoned by the yellow warning chips move directly to the warning character's clearing. Monsters that are summoned by sound chits or sight chits are placed into the clearing that contains the chit. It can happen that several map chits in a tile summon the same type of monsters. This happened with our Stink M and our Roar 6. In this case, warning chits summon first, then sound chits from lowest number to highest summon. This may cause multiple boxes of the same type of monster to come to the board, even though each chit only summons once. Each map chit may only summon monsters once per day. Once a map chit is turned face up to summon, it stays face up until midnight. If a map chit is face up at the beginning of a character's turn, it will not summon monsters when his turn ends. Monsters who appeared in or moved to a clearing automatically block all unhitting characters in that clearing. Hitting characters may block any monsters who arrive in their clearing if they wish. Monsters who did not appear or move do not block and cannot be blocked at this time, even if they are prowling. Number two, natives. If the character is in a clearing with a dwelling, the dwelling can summon natives. If the group of natives that is currently prowling is still on the setup card, and if the dwelling is listed above the box, then the natives appear in that clearing. Natives never move once they're on the map. Note that unlike map chits, dwellings only summon when a character is in that clearing. Not tile, but in the clearing with the dwelling. Okay, so that was Daylight. Um, pretty long, but... There's a lot to this game, so there's a lot to go over. 
Um, there's also even extra actions that haven't been gone over yet. There's ones affecting um, hired natives and magic that we're going to leave and go over during the um, hired natives and magic section. So go ahead and do that. Uh, I'd like to thank again uh, Stephen McKnight and uh, Patrick Van Beek have put in uh, character submissions for the Realm Speaks, and greatly appreciate that. Thanks a lot, guys, and uh, hopefully we get some more people get some up there because I think those are turning out really well so far. Um, and just thanks again to everyone who's helping out with uh, rule clarifications and pointing out some mistakes in the videos and everything. It's really appreciated. So hopefully we'll get through these pretty soon. Thanks for watching. See you next time.